Hi, everyone. And the participants are filling in. I'm Dr. Tad Fenton, and I'm one of the neurologists here in Ottawa. I'm substituting today for my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Ramachandra Nair, who um, usually hosts our uh, monthly sessions. Welcome. Um, today we have um, Dr. Deng Nguyen, who is a professor in the Department of Neurosciences in Montreal, who will be talking to us about the insula. Dr. Nguyen is um, uh, one perhaps of the foremost now uh, in terms of epileptologists in our country. Um, and he is an MD, PhD. He's uh, trained at Yale and um, uh, does lots of research on uh, not just the insula, but also on um, devices and other technologies that uh, enable us to sample the neurophysiology, especially in patients who have seizures. Um, and so today it's my pleasure to welcome him, um, Dr. Nguyen. Welcome to our uh, webinar. Thanks, Dad, for the uh, introduction. Oops, sorry. Okay. So I hope you can see my slides and hear me correctly. So, Looking good. Okay, so I was invited to talk to you uh, on insular and precuneal epilepsy, so I'll try and do my best. So here's my disclosure uh, statement. I've given talks for uh, several pharmaceutical companies, but I've all my uh, uh, or, uh, or all my speaker fees were donated to the Shun Foundation. So the objectives for today is to review the anatomy, connectivity, and functions of the insula and precuneus, to have a working knowledge of non-invasive and invasive techniques for diagnosing insula and precuneal epilepsy, although we'll spend less time on that, and also look at some surgical approaches to uh, deal with these uh, two types of epilepsy. So starting with uh, insular epilepsy. So most of you know this already, but the insula is the fifth load of the brain. It's located deep in the cellular fissure. It's divided by the central insular celsus into an interior portion made out of three or four short insular gyra and a posterior portion made, made out of two long insular gyra. It's a structure that is extremely well connected to surrounding brain lobes and brain regions. So here you can have a view of the connectivity of the uh, whole insula. This connectivity follows an anterior to posterior gradient, but you can see here it's connected to the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, and the parietal lobe, both in, in the medial portions of these lobes and the lateral portions of these lobes. And it has also direct connections to the uh, cingulate uh, gyrus. And as I said, um, the connectivity profile of the insula follows an anterior to posterior gradient and a uh, dorsal to ventral gradient. So here's the rost rostrocodal gradient. So uh, the anterior parts of the insula is mainly connected to anterior parts of the brain and uh, the posterior uh, part of the insula is more connected to posterior parts of the brain. And you can see the same uh, gradient, but uh, a dorsal ventral gradient. So uh, areas or subregions of the insula that, is, that are located more superiorly or dorsally are more, more connected to uh, um, frontal lobes and uh, parietal lobes and ventral portions of the insula will be more connected to temporal lobe or the orbital frontal cortex. So if you look at this particular subregion here, um, you can see that it's mainly connected to the prefrontal uh, cortex, the lateral part and the uh, medial part. And as you move more uh, posteriorly, then you can see it's more connected to premotor cortices and the supplementary motor area. And if you move even more posteriorly, then you can see it's connected as far as the uh, precuneus. And as you move more posteriorly, uh, inferiorly, then you can see here that this particular subregion here is more connected to uh, uh, the prefrontal cortex, but less so than the dorsal, the most dorsal part. It's still connected to the anterior cingulate gyrus, but you're starting to see some uh, connections to the temporal lobe. And as you move more uh, posteriorly, uh, in the ventral portion of the insula, then you have much more connections to the temporal lobe 
and more posteriorly. Regarding subcortical connectivity, then uh, we found that the amygdala is, it's mainly the ventral anterior portion of the uh, insula that is connected to the amygdala and the whole uh, ventral portion of the insula, including uh, the posterior part of the insula uh, that is well connected with the hippocampus. And of course, it's well connected to subcortical regions as well, especially the thalamus. So um, all of these connections, why does the insula have so many connections? Because it's involved in a variety, a vari a variety of uh, um, functions. Uh, it's uh, important for the processing of uh, uh, several senses, for uh, several stimuli, for example, somatosensory stimuli, viscerosensory stimuli, auditory stimuli, uh, olfactory stimuli, uh, painful stimuli. So <clears throat> typically uh, the, uh, how we uh, understand the function of the insula is the posterior insula is very important for the processing of uh, sensory stimuli. So here you have uh, um, somatosensory stimuli, including pain. You have auditory stimuli. You have uh, viscerosensory stimuli and auditory uh, olfactory gustatory stimuli. And all of this information is integrated in the posterior insula and transmitted to the anterior insula to be integrated into uh, several functions, for example, social emotional processing and higher cognitive functions such as uh, uh, decision-making and uh, uh, attention. So it's with uh, no surprise that when you stimulate the posterior insula, you can have auditory symptoms, you can have uh, somatosensory symptoms, which are mainly in the posterior insula, but sometimes you can see some overlap with the uh, middle insula. You can also have um, uh, vertigo sensations. You can have olfacto gustatory symptoms here. Uh, you can have speech uh, disorders because the insula is also part of the um, speech control. And um, yeah, so that's it. So when you stimulate the anterior superior insula, it's very rare that you'll have uh, any symptoms uh, because as I mentioned, it's mainly involved in higher cognitive functions such as uh, decision-making or attention. Uh, sometimes you can have a fear, anxiety, and uh, it has been reported to uh, uh, generate also uh, an ecstatic sensation, but that's very rare. Typically, when you have that, it's because you uh, the discharge has involved, has propagated to other areas. And sometimes you can also have uh, uh, laughing, but typically it's because you've uh, recruited other areas as well. So uh, because the insula can generate a lot of symptoms, um, people have, um, you have, have um, suggested that the insula is a great mimicker. Uh, it can give a classical, uh, you, it's divided in a classical insular uh, semiology, but sometimes it has a frontal-like flavor, sometimes it has a more parietal-like flavor, and sometimes it's has a more temporal lobe-like flavor. But when you, when, when you know well the anatomy and the functional connectivity of the insula, typically you have, uh, it's pretty easy to recognize most cases of insula seizures. So it, this is summarized in this figure here. So when you have seizures coming from the posterior uh, insula, especially the, the more ventral part, then typically you have somatosensory auras. You can also have a common, uh, it, these somatosensory auras combined with auditory auras and vestibular symptoms as well. If it's more in uh, the uh, uh, posterior uh, superior, um, more posterior superior portion of the insula, then you can have some, um, 
some uh, uh, somatosensory symptoms, but also you can have um, more uh, propagation to the SMA. So you can have some tonic and uh, uh, dystonic posturing. Um, if you have uh, um, seizures originating in the middle insula, then you have a lot of, uh, um, that's when you have the typical um, strangulation feeling. Uh, and you can also have uh, elementary oral uh, facial motor signs because it's very close to the inferior portion of the relandic uh, area. If you have a seizure that comes from the uh, anterior uh, superior part of the insula, typically here you don't have any auras. And because the seizure discharge propagates to the frontal lobe, then you'll have uh, hypermotor uh, manifestations. If you have seizures coming from the anterior inferior insula, then uh, you can have emotional auras, visceral sensations, gustatory sensations. And then typically, if it spreads through the temporal lobe, you'll have uh, oral elementary auto automatisms, altered uh, consciousness, to, uh, same, same thing as you would have with the temporal lobe seizures. Or it can spread to the orbital frontal cortex, and then you can have some uh, hyperkinetic uh, behavior as well. So here are some uh, examples. So this is a patient who had an inter interior focus and uh, with gelastic uh, seizures. So she would just laugh uh, during her seizures uh, with some impaired uh, awareness and some mild agitation. So that was a seizure discharge that came from the anterior uh, superior part of the insula propagating to uh, the prefrontal cortex. So, and then she, this evolved into a, a feeling of strangulation. That's why she's, uh, she's uh, panicking here. So this patient here had had the painful seizures uh, involved in uh, involving the uh, right upper limb, um, and then he takes some sort of a, a mild uh, dystonic posture. So he had a posterior insular focus, as expected. So this patient had a um, uh, mainly nocturnal seizures. Um, and when she would wake up, she would feel um, some tingling in her left hand. And after several seconds, she would have um, hypermotor uh, manifestations. And so because she had somatosensory symptoms at the onset of her seizures, uh, we suspected a posterior insular focus and that uh, what was found uh, after uh, intracranial EEG. And here the hypermotor manifestations are late. So typically in uh, insular epilepsy, hypermotor motor manifestations are the result of spread to the frontal lobe. And if you see 
uh, uh, some sort of delay between awakening or EEG seizure onset and, uh, until the uh, onset of hypermotor manifestations, then uh, of course uh, you have to think that it might uh, be coming from outside the frontal lobe. And here the aura tells you that it could have been uh, from an insular uh, or, uh, onset. Okay, so, uh, so in sewer spikes, uh, they can't be seen unless you have depth electrode recordings from the insula, and you will be on, only be able to see them with surface electrodes if the insula uh, spike propagates to the overlying um, cortex. Now these spikes, they don't, the insula spikes, they don't project randomly, but they uh, project typically through their um, connectivity profile. And so what we found here in, in a study using MEG was that insular spikes originating from the anterior superior insula would mainly project to the frontal lobe. Insular spikes coming from the interior inferior portion of the insula would mainly project to the anterior temporal lobe. And insular spikes coming from the posterior insula would mainly project to uh, central areas and posterior temporal uh, areas. So that's why, uh, that, so that explains well what we see on, on scalp EEG when you record patient, uh, when you analyze patients with uh, insular epilepsy. This, this is a work done uh, by uh, Rabbi Kapana who reviewed, uh, all, and uh, Laurence Martineau who reviewed all cases of uh, uh, insular epilepsy in the literature and they look at the topography of spikes. And typically, if you have an anterior uh, insular focus, your spikes are, the spikes are mainly uh, interior, like you have here, uh, T4, F8, F4, FP2, uh, if it's on the right side, of course. If it's in the middle insula, uh, same thing, but more C4, T4. If uh, it's, uh, the uh, posterior insula, then may, it's mainly over T4, C4, P4. Same thing if you look at the superior part portion of the insula versus the inferior portion of the insula. If it's the inferior portion of the insula, it's mainly over T4. While if it's the superior insula, then it's mainly a T4, but also C4, P4, and F4. Typically, when you have uh, uh, insular, uh, a case of insular or operculoinsular insular epilepsy, you have EEG changes. Um, here, uh, we found e uh, changes in 93% of seizures from, uh, from cases from the literature. Uh, the pattern can be diffuse or mainly temporal or frontal temporal. And um, if you have only auras, typically you don't have any EEG changes. There are no particular onset patterns you can see on the surface EEG. You can have different type of uh, um, ictal patterns. So as most cases of focal epilepsy, MRI is the most useful test to diagnose insular epilepsy. Here are some examples. Here's a patient with a, with a tumor. Here it's a, a tuber here with a cavernoma. And of course you can use a quantitative MR processing to identify subtle uh, focal cortical dysplasias as uh, in this case. In our experience and the experience of others as well, uh, MEG has, is quite useful to diagnose insular epilepsy. Uh, in our experience, it's the second most useful test. And uh, ICTOSPEG has been, in our experience, the third best test to diagnose or recognize an insular focus. Here, uh, in our experience, uh, correctly identified an opercular insular focus in 65% of cases. Sometimes it can provide misleading information because of propagation and typically the propagation will be in areas connected to that particular sub, uh, insular region. So for example, an in propagation to the temporal lobe, for example. PET, uh, it's been less useful in our experience, like it was concordant with the upper insular focus in 40% of cases, so half of cases. But in um, the experience of uh, Flashin's Shashu for 
Chassou, for example, in in uh, in Paris, she's had more um, a better experience, probably because because she co-registrates uh, the PET with the MRI, which can increase the sensitivity. So as you can see, now non-invasive tools can provide additional uh, clues to support clinical suspicion, but confirmation of insular seizures still require an intracranial EEG in many cases, especially those who are who are who are non-lesional. And so, uh, uh, although it's possible to sample the insula using a, a, a um, an open craniotomy with some old grids and combining with depth electrodes, uh, typically we use SEEG. So here is an example where uh, the physician wanted to map language more carefully, and he wasn't sure if, if it was a case of insular epilepsy or uh, uh, opercular epilepsy, and so. Uh, uh, there was an open craniotomy, opening of the sylvian fissure, insertion of depth electrodes, and then subdural grids uh, in the suprasylvian and infrasylvian region to allow mapping. But like I said, most cases now, uh, for most suspected cases of uh, insular epilepsy, uh, most of us will prefer SEG. So you have uh, orthogonal electrodes and depth electrodes that you can use, or you can use a combination of both. If you use uh, ortho orthogonal electrodes, then you only have a couple of contacts for each electrode uh, that will sample the insula. But the advantage is that you have also electrodes that sample the, the overlying operculate and the hidden surface of the operculate. If you use uh, death electrodes uh, in an oblique fashion, uh, then uh, you have uh, the advantages is that you don't have to, uh, there's less risk of. Uh, uh, injuring the uh, or touching vessels in the sylvian fissure. And also you can have more electrode contacts by sampling the insula. But uh, like I said, most of us will, uh, uh, most of us now will use a combination of oblique electrodes and death electrodes, uh, orthogonal electrodes. And so we can sample, uh, we can have many contacts in the insula and also we can sample the overlying operculae and the hidden portion of the operculae. So um, now how many death electrodes? Well, it depends on the situation. If you have, think you have a more posteriorly positioned focus or more uh, a more anterior position focus, or if you think uh, the main, uh, or if the main strategy is not the insula, uh, it's, uh, the lateral temporal lobe, or for example, or the inferior frontal gyrus, etc. So that depends on how many electrodes you, you will put uh, in the insula. So then uh, once you diagnose uh, insular or opercular insular epilepsy, then uh, you can, of course, consider op an operation. There are several types. You can have selective insulectomies and selectomies combined with uh, removal of a portion of the orbital frontal cortex, which is adjacent, adjacent uh, one of the operculae, uh, or a radical opercular insulectomy with the oper or removal of all the operculates, or sometimes combined with a temporal lobectomy. And so I'm not a neurosurgeon, but I can see how it might be difficult to operate in this area because of these dense vessels in the sylvian fissure. And also you have, um, underlying structures which are important, uh, putem in here, corpus, uh, internal capsule, internal capsule, and uh, on the dominant side, um, uh, the, anyways, I forget the term, but um, um, fibers connecting, connecting um, the vernicare area with Broca's area. So if you have, if you operate in this insula, one of the main um, uh, the, um, main uh, fears is that you injure perforators. And so if you uh, injure a perforator, you can have a supportable stroke, which can give you complications, including hemiparesis, for example. So that's why there are people who have, that have tried other surgical approaches, uh, such as, um, radio frequency thermal coagulation or laser ablation uh, using um, 
the monetary system or the, uh, uh, the what's the other name? The monetary and uh, anyways, um, the laser ablation. And you can have also um, responsive neurostimulation. Now we, um, Alex Bell uh, and Sami Obeid recently did a systematic review uh, and individual participant uh, data meta-analysis of <clears throat> uh, insular epilepsy uh, cases in the literature. And here they reviewed, they reviewed 24 retrospective uh, studies, which uh, included 312 participants with a median follow-up of 2.58 years. And here's what they found, seizure freedom, 66.3 at last follow-up, 79.1% at one year, 53% at five years, time to recurrence, typically 1.3 years here. Um, surgeries that were done uh, below 18 years of age and the use of intracranial uh, EEG were associated with a faster time to recurrence. And the use of uh, non-invasive techniques Radio frequency ablation uh, was associated with a poor, uh, poorer seizure outcome than uh, resection, which can be, uh, um, which is a, a little bit expected since uh, remove the, the volume of uh, resection is uh, is lower. So um, in this meta analysis, post op neurological complication was forty two point five percent. Most commonly, motor deficits, 3.8%, but permanent neural complications were fewer, 7.8%. Uh, the motor complications were only uh, were 5%. And typically, a resection of the frontal operculum had a greater odds of motor deficit. And uh, with dominant hemisphere resection, uh, you can have a post op uh, dysphagia, higher risk of post op dysphagia, dysphagia, which is understandable, but in their series, uh, the meta analysis. Uh, none were permanent. Regarding the neuro responsive neurostimulation, uh, there are a few cases reported in the literature, but none of them uh, are seizure-free. And so in summary of the first part on insular epilepsy, um, people say that opercular insular epilepsy semiology uh, is quite varied. And so it's a great mimic, uh, insular, epile uh, insular epilepsy is a great mimicker, but uh, in my mind, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's not the case if you know well the role, the function, and the connectivity of the insula. And so it's uh, uh, relatively easy to uh, suspect a case of insular epilepsy. For non-invasive tests, scalp EEG um, is, uh, uh, you have to look at uh, findings over the frontal, temporal, uh, and central parietal areas. MRI is better than is the best test, followed by MEG, followed by TILSPEG, followed by PET, and SEG is still very much uh, pertinent in uh, 2022. Regarding surgery, most become seizure-free, only a minority, minority have permanent neurological deficits. You have a lower seizure freedom rate if uh, the, there are pediatric patients, or if you require intracranial EEG, or, or do uh, minimally invasive procedures. Uh, preferably avoid transgression of the opercula if, if it's not in the epileptic zone to reduce the risk of complication. And dominant hemisphere resections are more likely to have transient language uh, deficits, but hope, uh, thankfully they're transient. Regarding the second part, the precuneus, then, um, uh, well, it's part, it's located here uh, in red. It's uh, in the medial portion of the, the superior parietal uh, lob lobule. It's bounded by the marginal branch of the cingulate salsus, the parietal uh, occipital fissure, and right behind it is the cuneus. And uh, you have the subparietal salsus, which is the inferior part here. Functions, well, it's uh, involved in tactile and body displacement perception, self-processing uh, operations, which allows one to evaluate or judge some feature in relation to one's perceptual image or mental concept of oneself. Visual spatial uh, episodic memory retrieval. Looking at its uh, connectivity, um, the interior part of 
the uh, precuneus is mainly connected to somatomotor uh, regions. So you can see here in blue connections to the, to the uh, um, uh, somatomotor uh, regions, but you can also, it includes the insula as well, which is involved in somatosensory uh, processing as well. The central cognitive part, uh, it's mainly connected to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the inferior parietal uh, lobule, and the superior te temporal uh, solstice. And so you can see it here, uh, in the middle part here. And the posterior part is mainly connected to pre striate areas, which, uh, so the posterior part, that's why it's called the visual part. The middle part, the central part is more called the cognitive part, and the interior part is mainly called the sensory motor part. And you have the inferior part, uh, which is, uh, of course, right above the posterior pre uh, singlet uh, area which is connected to um, the hippocampal uh, uh, gyrus and connected to the posterior cingulate gyrus and the rest of the cingulate gyrus. So this helps, uh, helps you to see uh, where uh, seizures from the precunal uh, area uh, or regions can propagate. So we'll see that a little bit uh, in the next few slides. When you stimulate the precuneus, uh, what you'll see uh, in the posterior precuneus, you'll have visual illusions or hallucinations, sometimes eyeball, eyelid movements, because uh, uh, you have the uh, uh, parietal eye fields uh, in the uh, parietal area. And if you stimulate the anterior precuneus, you can have body displacement perceptions and vertigo. Um, and that and this is mainly uh, seen uh, when you stimulate the non-dominant side. And this is, uh, like I said, um, expected, uh, knowing uh, the function and connectivity of these different parts of the precuneus. Regarding precuneal semiology, uh, it's quite tough to distinguish uh, seizures coming from the precuneus compared to uh, seizures coming from other uh, subregions of the parietal lobe. There's nothing clearly specific, uh, but consider involvement of the interior part, which is the sensory motor part, if you have somatosensory symptoms. Consider um, involvement of the central part of the precuneus, which is the integrative cognitive processing part, if you have motion sensation in the aura, and consider involvement uh, of the posterior part, which is the visual information processing part, if you have visual illusions or hallucinations. And typically, uh, the, uh, in, in, it's the same for all regions of the parietal lobe. Uh, mo uh, motor uh, signs uh, are typically the result of um, propagation. You can have Ventral, uh, ventral propagation to the temporal lobe and uh, dorsal propagation to the frontal lobe. And so when you have propagation to uh, the ventral, uh, more ventrally, then you'll have automatisms, autonomic symptoms. And if you have a more dorsal spread of discharge, then you can have uh, APCR contralateral head deviation, motor uh, clonic or dystonic uh, 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 signs. So typically, this is for the aurons when the seizure starts, and late late signs are typically from propagation. So here are some examples. So 
So here you, you, you can't see much, right? you have to, uh, but the patient feels that her, uh, there's something wrong with her eye, with, uh, some non-specific visual uh, illusion. So that's why she's hiding her eyes with both her hands. Um, and so it's more experiential here. You don't see much uh, clinical signs on this video. But this patient had a, um, a seizure focus in the posterior precuneus. That's why she had uh, visual symptoms here. <laughs> So this patient, you don't see much as well. Actually, he's, he's shouting because he has the, the impression that he's falling down. Um, uh, so it's as if, it's, for example, he's in the, an elevator and it's falling down. And so that's why he, he, he has a fearful expression and he's holding onto rails. <clears throat> and uh, so it's more a body sensation uh, aura. Uh, and he had a, a, a seizure focus in the uh, more central part of the precuneus. the seizure spread to the temporal lobe. And then, uh, oh, the Sorry, Dan, we, we couldn't hear you very well when we okay. were explaining the semiology. But yeah, so okay. uh, the, the, the last video was a patient who had uh, he, he reported to the technician that he had some sort of visual current. So uh, um, you don't see much on the video, especially. Uh, in the beginning because it, everything is, is experiential. And after several seconds, you can see that he has um, uh, automatisms. Uh, that's because the discharge has spread to the temporal lobe. And so you can have uh, uh, manual automatisms uh, on the left side and a little bit of tonic posturing on the right side. So it's thank a you. No, no, thank you. It's, it's very, very helpful for the educational component. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, and this patient, that patient here, uh, was um, is a patient with uh, somatosensory symptoms, and then uh, eventually dystonic uh, uh, posturing and generalized tonic tonic seizures. So, uh, so there, like I said, these are examples: patients with somatosensory symptoms, uh, so patients with uh, visual symptoms, and patients with body uh, sensory. Here's a, uh, these are, uh, it's an interesting case that was uh, reported in the literature and uh, that was shared by me by Steve Gibbs. It's a case of uh, uh, sleep hypermotor epilepsy. So during uh, mild seizures, the patient would just have uh, awakening. 
he would have occasional aura of levitation. And for a longer seizures, you can see the spread uh, to the frontal lobe with some hypermotor manifestations. Cinque, cinque, alza il braccio sinistro, benissimo, abbassa, continua questi movimenti, non si capisce una cosa, è qualche clonia al labbro, quindi è rosso in volto, quindi dove siamo? Dove siamo? Dove ti trovi? In che città sei? Ora allora non mi risponde più. Ok. In precranial epilepsy, is a clinical EG correlation, although uh, often inaccurate. Um, generally point to the posterior quadrant. Uh, Interictal EEG typically are, is more regional rather than focal. For example, you have parietal occipital spikes, uh, central parietal spikes, uh, by, which are bilateral, but with ipsilateral predominance. And occasionally you'll have misleading ipsilateral temporal or frontal predominant spikes, and that's well reported in the literature. And with ictal EEG, Typically, the discharge is more regional or bilateral or often uh, diffuse with a predominance on one side. Um, but you can have maximal buildup posteriorly or anteriorly, uh, depending on, on the propagation. So um, there's a uh, posterior to anterior flavor to most cases, but it's clear that you can have misleading uh, uh, discharges from a ventral or dorsal propagation. And structural imaging, uh, as any uh, focal epilepsy, uh, MRI is the best to uh, identify a case of posterior epilepsy. Um, and similar to uh, insular epilepsy, uh, PET and SPEC uh, do less well. And surgery, of course, is, is uh, possible. Uh, there are uh, cases reported in several cases reported in the literature. Uh, the series are not that um, not not that many because most series they include all types of all patients with posterior uh, epilepsies or all parietal uh, all parietal parietal regions of all regions of the parietal lobe, and so it's hard to distinguish cases of precranial epilepsy per se, but. We recognize that surgery in the precranial area can lead to quadru quadranopia, uh, hemineglec on the non-dominant side, hypoesthesia, and neuropsychological deficit, for example, uh, mild language impairments on the dominant side. Um, then, so the summary for the second part, uh, precranial epilepsy should, should be suspected if you have uh, visual illusions hallucinations or a sensation of body movement and sometimes uh, uh, paresthesias. If absent and if MRI is negative, the diagnosis may be quite difficult and lead to surgical failure. Uh, look for a posterior predominance on EEG, but remember that uh, interictal uh, discharges are often more scattered and in ictal EEG is less localizing than, for example, temporal lobe seizures. Surgery is possible, but uh, complications uh, are not rare. So that's it for me. I hope I'm, yeah, right, 45 minutes. So uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to, to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen. That was excellent. Um, Dan, I... I have a question because we haven't kind of addressed much the EEG findings during these, these issues, a lot of semiology and uh, anatomical correlation. Um, any, any tips about when to suspect um, insular um, um, versus other, for instance, temporal or parietal, um, and when to suspect a precranial onset of seizures for the audience? Thank you. Yeah, so like I said, so if you have an insular case, uh, most, most of the time on EEG, you'll have some lateralizing finding, typically from spike, interictal spikes. Uh, from seizures, they are less localizing, but certainly uh, spikes are uh, quite helpful uh, in lateralizing. 
typically they're uh, depending on if it's a posterior focus or anterior focus or superior or inferior, but it will be located in the frontal leads, the temporal leads, uh, central leads, uh, posterior temporal leads, or middle or posterior temporal leads. But you know you have to put this in combination with semiology. So for example, if you have a hypermotor uh, uh, hypermotor seizures, and you don't you have uh, for example, uh, temporal spikes, then you know it's a big red flag that it could be an insular case because uh, of course you would expect frontal frontal polar or frontal central or uh, spikes, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't make sense that you have temporal spikes in a case of hypermotor uh, seizures, and so uh, that's uh, so you have to combine. Uh, clinical manifestations with electrical findings, of course. Um, and then afterwards, once you suspect it might be uh, uh, an insular focus, then you have to do other tests, non-invasive tests. And here, of course, uh, like I said, uh, MRI, MEG, uh, spec, et cetera, that will be useful. And then implantation uh, with uh, remembering that it can come from the insular, for example. Mm -hmm. And so um, for Precranial epilepsy, uh, it's a little bit like other um, uh, cases of parietal uh, epilepsy, uh, epilepsies. Typically, the, the interictal spikes are more scattered. So it's very rare you'll just have you like, you know, a, a, Be set. A, a, <laughs> yeah, for example, you, you should, that you, you're quite lucky if you have that. Typically, it's more uh, regional, uh, more scattered. Uh, and uh, also it's, it goes with our experience that typically in posterior epilepsies, typically it's, uh, unless you have a very focal lesion, uh, a lot of times uh, for a surgery to be successful, successful it, it has to be quite uh, large. Yeah. Um, and so um, it goes in, it's in the same line of idea. So um, in posterior epilepsies, uh, Preconal epilepsies, the discharges are more scattered. And uh, it's, there's numerous, numerous cases in the literature where you could have temporal spikes as well, or you can have frontal predominant spikes uh, from propagation, but without necessarily, um, without necessarily be associated with a poor outcome. Mm -hmm. So oh, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Tad. There are a lot of questions in the chat. Yes. And I asked mine to, to give time for, for the chat to build up. So it, it was a good one. Dang, a few questions here. The first is, do you have a, a good way to distinguish in terms of visual symptoms? Um, you know, this uh, semiology of precranial onset seizures from occipital onset seizures? Yes, of course, but everybody knows this. If it's more elementary or like just flashing lights, then it, of course it's more posterior. The more anterior uh, the seizure focus is, the more complex it is, uh, the less um, elementary the visual uh, symptoms are. And another one here, uh, some cases um, have shown that um, there's a, both a, an occipital lobe abnormality with a precranial abnormality. In your experience, have you seen cases like this where the potentially malformation of development could affect both areas? Yeah, so that it's the experience of most of us uh, who have dealt with cases of posterior epilepsies. Typically, it doesn't uh, follow not uh, necessarily a margin. Uh, and so it's very frequent that posterior resections, they need to be larger, uh, especially in non-lesional cases. Uh, the only cases that uh, have limited uh, or smaller resections are you know, cases with a very uh, circumscribed lesion. Do you find that there is a role for any additional scalp um, electrodes, in particular over periselvian uh, you know, regions to help localize, um, refine well, your localization? I'm not sure I have the answer to that. But in our institution, we, of course, we use also midline, uh, midline, uh, we always read EEGs with the midline um, leads. Uh, so CZ, PZ, and 
FZ, etc. So that's a very useful. I know that some some younger um, or trainees or some younger physicians they they only use the double banana and without the central leads. But of course, it's very helpful to have these central leads and to look at them because you can miss some uh, some discharges from the vertex. In your experience, is there any contraindication when you have a suspected case of dominant uh, insular lobe epilepsy to, to surgery or, or, you know, an actual surgical intervention? I assume, I assume that the reader means with respect to language or, or yeah, just fallout. So the first thing is uh, if you want to upgrade uh, in the insula, you need somebody who has experience. And so that's the one important factor. Uh, the second, so he has to know that, well the anatomy and all the vessels in the area, et cetera. Uh, opening the sylvian fissure, doing you know, careful to retract uh, the operculae to reach the insula, et cetera. So that's very important. Second thing is you need to make sure if you really need to touch the operculae or not. So of course there are cases that that are pure insular epilepsies and in our case that are opercular insular epilepsies. And so that's why just oblique electrodes typically are not sufficient. Uh, you, it's important to sample also the operculae because most complications come from removal of the operculae rather than the insula per se. If you need to, and so by doing a CAG, you can determine what you need to resect and then for your resection. And I've shown that in the meta-analysis that you know, removal of the operculae is, is associated with a higher risk of complications. Now, if you remove the insula per se on the dominant side, we've never seen any complications with that. The insula is part of the language network, but it's, an, uh, it's not a, a crucial area, it's an associative area. And so if you remove uh, the insula, even if you if even if you stimulate the insula and you have your arrest of speech or we're finding difficulties, you can still remove it. The patient will recuperate. He'll have transient of, uh, of dysphagia for a few hours or days, but he he will recuperate, uh, especially in our young patients that we up. Uh, the the it's a bit different if you there's an involvement of the opercula, of course, if, if there's involvement of uh, it extends to vernicae or broca. Of course, you, you, you don't touch vernicae or, or, or broca. Okay, thank you. I have uh, another colleague here who's asking if pain is a specific sign of the posterior insula, uh, citing a case that uh, the pe person is following with a very painful sensation of the arm lasting so up to an hour. That's very specific. It's the only area when you stimulate that you have pain. Um, so it's the posterior insula and S2, the second som somatosensory region, which is extent, of course. Uh, you can have, so it's very diff It's not the same thing as, as ictal headache. That's something different, okay? Uh, limb pain is very specific to the posterior insula. Sometimes patient will have tonic posturing and or uh, uh, Jacksonian seizures for motor seizures, for example but it's not the same type of pain. It's not really painful. Uh, it's not the same, um, yeah, it's not the same type of, um, uh, it's not the same type, type of ictal limb pain. And so ictal pain, uh, limb pain to my, in my opinion is very specific to the posterior app, just one of the rare specific signs that you can have. G GP, did you wanna ask something? Sorry, I thought you. <laughs> No, I was going to say that uh, we we have uh, cases with posterior insular burning sensation. It's, it's so painful that the child complain of a burning sensation in the hand for about 30 seconds. And, and, and that was the clinical manifestation. Uh, it would evolve into a more um, decreased awareness. It has been shown in PET study or in fMRI that thermal sensation is a process in the posterior and so the, the thermal part of also is, is, uh, is more posterior insulin. Exactly, thank you. Um, one colleague is asking whether um, it's possible that a temporal lobe onset can be early in a patient who has MRI findings of a cortical dysplasia in the precuneus. Um, I, I, can you repeat that? 
Yeah. So I'm not sure if it's, it's, it's phrased, but the, the, um, you know, would it be possible that uh, temporal lobe onset is early or is seen early in a patient who may have MRI findings instead showing precuneal malformation of development like a cortical dysplasia? Yeah, it's diff difficult to, uh, to respond. Yeah, as you know, uh, dual pathologies uh, exist. I don't know if it's a case uh, of that. Inadequate sampling during SEEG, or uh, it could be uh, a complex, for example, DNet patients can have complex networks. And so it might be uh, uh, that they have both. Uh, of course, we've seen cases of uh, with precuneal epilepsy, but with also quote unquote, secondary epileptogenesis or a, a more complex network involving the temporal lobe. And so uh, patients who've had uh, failures from removing the precranial uh, part. And so we, we have cases like that, but of course, every, every case is different. There's one, um, just I think the last try one. to answer this one, uh, but I, I skipped it just because our colleague had already asked one, but I want to go back to it. Um, it how important is um, ictal propagation in understanding the epileptic network involved in insular epilepsy uh, which would then tie into would wider resections actually improve surgical outcomes? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand the question, but... Uh... I, I guess he's asking, is it very important to map out the network if you think you're dealing with insular epilepsy and hence would wider resections result in improved outcomes? Okay, so um, there's no... Um... Well, as most of you know, there's no answer to that. Uh, I understand what you mean. Um, how each of us practice and how we decide which area we resect, it's, it's a multimodal processing of information. Uh, is it dangerous to remove that part or not? Is it early propagation? Is it almost synchronous? Um, what do the what's the sub underlying substrate? So there's no good answer to that. Sometimes, of course, we'll remove a little bit more than what uh, is object can be seen objectively on SEEG because we know we don't have uh, perfect sampling uh, with the electrodes that we have. So there's no good answer to that. Um, and there are also, uh, it's, a, it's even more complicated uh, because in some cases, of course, if you put electrodes in areas uh, of the network, sometimes you can see simultaneous discharge from two separate distant regions, for example, the dorsal insula with the single gyrus, and then it's a nightmare, you don't know uh, which one you have to remove because they're not really adjacent. And, uh, and so you have to rely on everything else. So there are cases like that. And you can see some, some uh, uh, other people have seen this. Uh, we call them um, insulo singulo, uh, singulate uh, epilepsies. Like there are, there's a direct connection from the dorsal insula to the singular gyrus. And we don't know uh, sometimes Nope, I think we lost Dr. Nguyen briefly. Um, we'll just see if he's oh, still with us. Dan, can you hear us? Uh, uh, something locally is happening. Um, Dan, can you hear us? <clears throat> I think we are on time as well, Dan. So probably yeah. we're going to need to wrap up. Um, well, I yeah. Yeah, I think. Uh, Dan, can you hear us? We lost you for a few seconds. Yeah. Um, That's okay. I yeah. uh, I hate to leave it like that, but I I want to yeah. thank Dr. Nian for the hour uh, long teaching. It was uh, it was. Oh, there you are. Oh. Are you back, Dan? Or kind of. I never left. No. No, oh. <laughs> there, there was a there was a problem with with locally uh, we lost you for a few seconds and and uh, we we lost the last.
component of your answer, but we were just saying that uh, due to the time constraints, I think it's, we're probably gonna need to wrap it up. Um, and Dan was just uh, starting to thank you. So Dan, eh, sorry, yes. Dan, sorry that was yeah, I, to thank you, yeah. Thank you for taking the time, Dr. Nguyen. Uh, it was a pleasure having you and uh, thanks everyone for coming and participating and asking these wonderful questions. Um, we're on schedule for next month, so hopefully uh, you can attend and uh, have a good weekend. Okay. Thanks Bye again, Dr. Nguyen. Great talk, great talk. Thank you so much, Dan. Appreciate it. Uh, bye, everybody. Have a lovely weekend.